King of kings and Lord of lords. The one who lives forever. The father of the fatherless. The original father. We worship you. The one who is alive forevermore. We bow before you. Accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for mighty things you are doing in our times. Thank you for mighty testimonies. Thank you for raising the dead. Thank you for defeating fire. Thank you for opening wombs. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, for saving souls. Lord, accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for January. Thank you for February. Thank you for what you did last month. Thank you now for April. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Thank you for all the girls that were released. Thank you because the others will also be released. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Father, we are all your children. We parents as well as our children. We are children in your hand. You have been before the mountains. We are all very little children in your hands. Tonight, Father, let our peace be great. Keep terror far away from us. And all those who may gather against our families, Father, scatter them all. From this moment, my Father and my God, every reproach, every shame in our lives, in our families, bring to an end. Let our glories begin. Thank you, my Father and my God. Tonight, do marvelous things. Save souls. Heal the sick. Set the captives free. Let there be mighty testimonies. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Uh, shake hands with one or two people and say, God is going to bless you and bless your family. And then you may please be seated. I want to spend a few minutes talking to those who are yet to surrender their life to Jesus so they can do so, so they don't miss the blessings of tonight. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 44. Ezekiel 16, verse 44. Behold, everyone that useth Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. That's another way of saying, like father, like son, or like mother, like daughter. In fact, the elders have a saying. They said instead of things getting better for a woman who happens to be a witch, all her children are girls. They said <laughs> witchcraft is being multiplied. In other words, they say that if the mother is a witch and she has a daughter, <laughs> if you are a sensible boy, don't marry that daughter. Because if we are to believe the elders, when mama is about to go, she will pass it in on to her daughter. 
like mother, like daughter, like father, like son. Jesus put it in another way in John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44. He was talking to the Pharisees. He said, you have your father, the devil, and the will of your father, you will do. So if the children are going to be blessed, we need to do something about the parents. James chapter 1 verse 17. James 1 17 says, God is the father of lights. He said every good and perfect gift come from above. Come down from the father of lights. And Matthew 5 verse 14, Matthew 5 14, Jesus Christ said, ye are the lights of the world. That means if the father is light, he gives birth to lights. The implication of that is if the father is darkness, he's likely to give birth to darkness. If the father is blessed, like I told those who came to Divine Encounter on Monday, because blessing flows like a river downstream, if the father is blessed, the children are automatically going to be blessed. Genesis chapter 28, if you read it from verse 10 to 16, Genesis 28, 10 to 16, God said to Jacob, I am the God of your father Abraham. That is why I'm going to bless you, Jacob. If the father is blessed, the son will be blessed. If the father is cursed, God have mercy on the children. Because curse also flows down like a river. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 20 to 27. 2 Kings 5, 20 to 27. Elisha said to Gehazi, The leprosy of Naaman will cleave unto you and unto thy seed forever. Science is beginning to discover that if there's any particular sickness or disease in a father, sooner or later it's going to show up either among the children or the grandchildren. It will interest you to know that the African elders knew this long ago. You go to a family, you say you want to marry their daughter, they say, go, we are fired. Go. Come back for an answer. Why do they ask you to go? So that they can go and verify your family. They want to find out, has there been a leper before in the family? Has there been a madman before in the family? Because they know that sooner or later this thing will show up again. Our parents didn't go to the university, but they are deep in knowledge. That's why I, I tremble. For this young generation who want to marry on Facebook, <laughs> you marry on Facebook, you never can tell what else will come with the thing you are marrying. If the father is caused, unless something is done about that curse, the children are in trouble. If the parent is one of the people that God calls wicked, and that's a sinner, 
One who is not born again. As far as God is concerned, he is considered wicked. Then according to Psalm 7, verse 11, Psalm 7, verse 11, the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. If God is angry with the parents every day, what do you think is going to happen to the children? But David said in Psalm 27, verse 5, Psalm 27, verse 25. Psalm 27, verse 25. He said, I was young. Now I'm old. I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. If the parents are of the Lord, one way or the other, God will always supply their needs. If the parents belong to the Lord, there is no way the children will end up begging for bread. That's the word of God. And it's forever settled. Of course, the parents could be blessed. And the son or daughter may decide, I don't want to go the way of my parents. I don't want their God to be my God. I don't want to serve their Jesus. I want to do things my own way. And in that case, God will move that fellow away from the line of blessing. If the family is cursed, and somebody in the family decides to move onto the side of the Lord. God will move him away from the line of causes and he will begin to enjoy the blessings of the children of God. So tonight, make a choice. Will you want to be among those that God is angry with on a daily basis? Or you want to be one of those people who you are sure God will never forsake him and his children will never beg for bread. The choice is yours. What is involved in giving your life to Jesus Christ is so tremendous. It makes a lot of difference between life and death, causes and blessings. And it makes a lot of difference concerning your children coming after you. So if you are here tonight and you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ, if not only for your sake, but for the sake of your children, come and surrender your life to Jesus. Because God is angry with the sinner every day but he will never forsake the righteous and his children will never beg bread if only for the sake of your children come and surrender your life to jesus christ and as for you children nobody is ever too young to decide for jesus christ if you give your life to jesus even if there's a curse in your family that curse will miss you so come and give your life to Jesus now. If only for the sake of your children, come and give your life to Jesus. Let him remove every curse on you and on your family. And if you are a child, come and give your life to Jesus so that in case there is a curse in your family, because we miss you. Now those of you who have already come and those of you who are on the way, talk to the Lord now. Ask him to have mercy on you. Ask him to please save your soul. Tell him you have come to surrender your life to him, that he should please receive you and bring you into the family of God. Begin to pray, even as you are coming, Call on him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Save my soul. I will be yours forever. I will live the rest of my life for you. 
Talk to the Lord. And the rest of us, please let's stretch our hands towards all these our new brothers and sisters and intercede for them. The God who saved our souls will save their own souls also. Pray that God will wash them clean with his powerful blood so that the anger of God will no longer be on them. Pray for them, brethren, that God will have mercy on them, will save the soul of the parents, save the soul of children, save the soul of everyone who had come to him today, whether they are here in the old auditorium or anywhere else in the world, that God will receive them and have mercy on them and save their souls. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Savior, I just want to thank your name. I want to give you all glory and honor for your word and for these people who have come forward to surrender their lives to you. Please remember your promise that whosoever will come unto you, you will no wise cast out. They've come to you now, Father. Please receive them in Jesus' name. Every sin they have ever committed, my Father and my God, wipe it away with your blood. Save their souls. Write their names in the book of life. Receive them into the family of God. And Father, from now on, any time they call on you, please answer them by fire. And cancel every curse on them in Jesus' name. Please, Lord, let them serve you to the end. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. Verse 18. Thank you, band. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. And I believe this passage is written for me. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord had given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. I decree that concerning every one of you listening to me now, you and your children will be for signs and for wonders. The child of a conqueror should be a conqueror. The day an elephant is born, a baby elephant, a day old, is already bigger than a goat. That very day is born. It's already bigger than the biggest of goats. I'm decreeing in the name that's above every other name. Your children will be far stronger than all their enemies. Because of time, I will very quickly go through my sermon. I won't break in between to ask you to pray. You pray at the end. Because I want us to get to the anointing section very quickly. Because there's quite a crowd here. And even almost a bigger crowd at the old arena. I'm going to talk about few children of conquerors and how they came out stronger even than their parents. Because whether the devil likes it or not, in the name that's above every other name, your children will be greater than you. Yeah. 
Let's start with Isaac. His father rose from nothing to greatness. Abraham was not anyone special until God called him in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. All of a sudden, he just came on the scene and God said unto Abraham, Obey me, then I will bless you. By the time we go to Genesis 24, verse 34 to 35, Genesis 24, 34 to 35, the servant of Abraham said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord has blessed my master greatly. Every one of you who are already in the Lord, who are parents here today, the Lord will bless you greatly. Yeah. But his son Isaac was greater than him. In Genesis 24, 26 rather, Genesis 26, from verse 12 to 14, Genesis 26, 12 to 14, in spite of the economic situation in the land, Isaac became very great. He was greater than his father. He conquered famine. He conquered persistent failure and defeat in Genesis 26, verse 19 to 22. Genesis 26, 19 to 22, as he was digging wells, as soon as he dug a well and there was water, enemies came and took the well away from him. He would dig another one. They would come again and take away the well from him. They kept on attacking him, but he overcame. Every force attacking your children will be scattered from tonight. He was a child of joy. He conquered sorrow in his family. Genesis 21, from verse 1 to 6. Genesis 21, verse 1 to 6. He was a child of laughter. There was sorrow in the family before he came. When he came, it was laughter all the way. Because of your children, in the name that's above every other name, sorrow will become a stranger to your family too. Isaac was a child of multiplied blessing. You see, the blessing in the family just kept on multiplying. If God can do it for Isaac, he can do it for any child. It is possible for your child to be far, far greater than you. Physical child, spiritual child, it can happen. Years ago, we, we, we normally, around July, we'll go to America to attend Kenneth Higgins camp meeting. I've told you the story before of how the first time I, I met him and I saw the beautiful things God was doing, I insisted that he must pray for me. He did. By the time he died, and they were doing his funeral. They announced that during his lifetime, more than 6,000 students graduated from his Bible college. And the people clapped. I said, God, thank you. Thank you for a great father. But in the redeemed Christian Church of God, every year, more than 7,000 students graduate from the Bible College every year. 
I pray for someone here today, your children will be greater than you. Well, as one of my children will say, if your amen is louder than that of your neighbor, then the prayer will be for you. <laughs> Let us consider Joshua. His spiritual dad was Moses. And Moses was great. No doubt about that. Moses delivered the whole nation out of captivity. Exodus chapter 12 from verse 1 to 41. Exodus 12 verse 1 to 41. Moses split a sea into two just by raising his hand. Exodus chapter 14 verse 1 to 28. Exodus 14, 1 to 28. Moses turned bitter water to sweet. Exodus 15, verse 22 to 26. Exodus 15, 22 to 26. When the children of Israel got to Mara and they couldn't drink the water because it was bitter, God showed Moses what to do. He did it and the water became sweet. Moses produced something out of nothing. He brought water out of the rock. Exodus 17, verse 1 to 6. Exodus 17, verse 1 to 6. Moses was great. But Joshua was greater. He did much more than his father. For example, he succeeded where his father failed. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 8. Joshua 1, verse 1 to 8. He was the one that God said, okay, Moses didn't get the people to the promised land, but I will do it through you. Oh, he was the one who was fighting in the valley when his father was on the mountain top praying. Exodus 17, verse 8 to 13. I'm talking of Joshua. Exodus 17, 8 to 13. He was the one who led the people to shout and the wall of Jericho came down. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 to 20. Joshua 6, verse 1 to 20. That was Joshua. But as great as Moses was, there is something that Joshua did that Moses never did. He stopped the sun. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 to 14. Joshua 10, 12 to 14. It was Joshua who said to the sun, son, stay where you are. Because I have a business to be doing for the Lord. Moon, remain where you are. And they obeyed him. It was Joshua that God used to finally fulfill the destiny of Moses. Because what God told Moses when he was sending him to Egypt was, you go and bring the people and they will come and serve me on this mountain. Moses couldn't get the people into the promised land, but Joshua did. There's a destiny for you, parents, that might not be 100% fulfilled while you are seeing in this world. But in the name that's above every other name, because of your children, all your destiny shall be fulfilled. I told you what happened the first time we went to America with my father and the Lord. 
And a preacher came down from the pulpit and stood in front of him and said, what God promised you is about to be fulfilled. And I, I asked Papa later on because he couldn't understand English. And I, he said, what did the man say? And I said, he said, what God promised you is about to fulfill it. What is it that God promised you? And the old man began to cry. So when I started, when he called me to start this church, he told me the church would go around the whole world. Now I'm about to die. <laughs> and the church is still within Nigeria. The God had already prepared a son who would take over from him. And today, by God's grace, that church is in more than 190 nations of the world. There is a promise God made concerning you and your family. Even if they are not 100% fulfilled while you are here, they will be fulfilled through your children. I'm sure some of you will say, are there promises he had made to you, sir? that you are not even sure will be fulfilled while you are here? I, I'm not so sure. I'm trying my best. I'm running as hard as I can. But I know one of the, one of the visions of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, if Jesus tarries, is that in every family of the world, every family of the world, there must be at least a member of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. I know that is going to come to pass. And I believe it's going to use some of you to make it come to pass. Let me take another example. Take the example of Samuel. Thank you, Father. The Lord said there's somebody here tonight who said you will understand. He asked me to tell you, I've not finished with you. I am just starting. If you are the one, let me hear your amen loud and clear. Oh, thank you, Father. The Lord said, there's someone here tonight, someone listening to me and whether here or you are hearing somehow. He said, the doctors have told you that your case is irreversible. Daddy asked me to tell you, I will prove them wrong. <laughs> Consider Samuel. Samuel was the son of a prayer warrior. Her mother could pray. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. 1 Samuel 1 verse 9 to 10. Thank God for parents who can pray. She prayed. Her mother was a partner of a covenant keeping God. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 to 20, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11 to 20, she made a covenant with God. Give me a son, and I will give him back to you. The mother was a warrior, a partner of a covenant-keeping God. And then he produced somewhere. Ah. The prayer warrior produced a king maker. The first king in Israel was anointed by Samuel, the son of a prayer warrior. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 to 9. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 to 9. The second king in Israel was anointed by Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verse 1 to 13. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1 to 13. 
the same Samuel, just to show you how powerful he was, was not just a king maker, he was a king remover. First Samuel 15, verse 16 to 29. First Samuel 15, 16 to 29. When he said to a king, your kingdom is over, it is over. A king tore his dress. He said, ah, you tore my dress? Your kingdom is torn. Powerful. He was a man of decrees. When he spoke, it happened. For Samuel chapter 3, verse 19. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 19. The Bible said God did not allow the word of Samuel to fall to the ground. He was a man of decrees. He would just decree and it will happen. But then, there's something very, very special about Samuel. He was a prophet. And I like that. I mean, he was a prophet. For Samuel chapter 3, from verse 19 to 21. For Samuel 3, 19 to 21. He wasn't uh, one of those people who would say, Ah, thus says the Lord, it's going to rain. And they are prophesying in June in Nigeria. They know that's the rainy season. It wasn't one of those prophets who, who will come to you and say, uh, Thus said the Lord, you have two cars, you must give one of them to me. It's not that kind of rubbish prophet. This is, this is a prophet who, who, <laughs> who will call things that be not as though they were, who can prophesy. And it will come to pass. Because true prophecy, when they come, they sound impossible. And I, I'll give you an illustration very quickly of what, what true prophet is, is like. To encourage somebody in particular tonight. Because every impossibility in your life is going to become possible. Years ago, there were three people contesting for the presidency of this nation. Amin Okano, Abiola and Tofa. And I was just minding my own business, just praising God, praying. When all of a sudden God spoke to me, now I'm not claiming to be a prophet, but I hear from him once in a while. And God said, Son, in the coming election, the winner is the loser. The loser is the winner. And the most fortunate of them all is Amino Kano. Ah. What's the meaning of this? I knew what he told me. And I know his voice. And I have good news for you. He's told me that those of you who are here tonight is going to be well with you. I don't say God said if he hasn't spoken. It doesn't make sense to say that the dress you were wearing last Holy Ghost service has become special. Yet he said so. And if he says so, it is so. I thank God that we are hearing testimonies. Before the election, Amin Okano died. So how do we, how do we join this to what God has said? And then we had a meeting, and at that time I was president of the PFM, Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria. And all the PFA had a meeting at uh, Tafar Baliwa Square. And the leaders came to me and said, 
who are we going to vote for? Because now we have Abiola is a Muslim, Tofa is a Muslim, we are Christian. Who are we to vote for? I said, well, you go and vote according to your conscience, but neither of them is going to reign. Oh, they said, come on now. <laughs> when you toss a coin, it is either head or tail. Uh, two people contesting. One has to be a winner, and the other will be a loser. I said, Daddy said, the winner is the loser, the loser is the winner. <laughs> well, you know the rest of the story. Abiola won the election. Did he ever read the throne? The one who lost ended up laughing. This man who won ended up in prison. Me, they say I lost. At least I'm in my house. The winner is the loser. The loser is the winner. The most fortunate is the one who wasn't even around to see the mess. I decree in the name that's above every other name, in the name of the one who called me, from now on, no more shame for you. Now, David, his father was a conqueror. How? Because his father was chosen. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. First Samuel 16, verse 1. God said to Samuel, Why are you mourning for Saul? I've rejected him. Fill your cup with oil or your horn with oil. I will send you to the house of Jesse, the, Beth the Bethlehemite, because in his house, have provided me a king. Of all the houses in Israel, God chose the house of Jesse. I'm going to be liberal. I'm going to say that if God chooses ten houses for special blessing in this nation, may your house be one of them. Jesse was specially chosen by God. And one of his children is David. Oh, if we talk about David, if we talk about Conqueror, you know he was a giant killer. 4 Samuel 17, 34 to 51. 4 Samuel 17, 34 to 51. He killed Goliath. He destroyed the one who had been terrorizing a whole nation. He was a demon tamer. When David sang, demons go to sleep. 4 Samuel 16, verse 15 to 23. 4 Samuel 16, 15 to 23. Not only was he a giant killer, demon tamer, he was even a producer of mighty men. 4 Samuel 22, verse 1 to 2. 4 Samuel 22, verse 1 to 2. A lot of hopeless people gathered themselves to David and he became their captain. Later on in 2 Samuel 23, 2 Samuel 23, you can read it from verse 8 to 39. 
Second Samuel 28, from verse 8 to 39, David turned those vagabonds to mighty men. And when the Bible says mighty, it means mighty. And there's a lot of things I like about David. He was a poet. I love him a lot. The Bible calls him the sweet psalmist of Israel. Second Samuel chapter 23 verse 1. Second Samuel 23 verse 1. He, he, he was a composer, a songwriter, a good singer. And of course, he was a king. You, you all know that. When we talk about David, we call him King David. Second Samuel chapter 5 verse 3. Second Samuel 5 verse 3. But he was also a prophet, a poet, composer, uh, <laughs> king, prophet. Because it, the three mightiest prophecies about the Lord Jesus Christ came through David. Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Came through David. And he was not talking about himself. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. What will happen when he, uh, when he hung on the cross? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He was talking about this ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today. Thousands of years before Jesus was born. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. He was talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Three mighty prophecies. Jesus in the first coming. Jesus, present ministry. Jesus in the future. But not only that, David became the father of the king of kings himself. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Mark 10, 46 to 52. Bartimaeus called him, called Jesus, Jesus, thou son of David. He called the king of kings the son of David. You might be small today, unknown. But through your children, you can be known throughout the world. At least one of your children can become so mighty that where you never, never thought you could reach, it will take your name there. Yeah. My father was a lay reader in the Anglican Church. <laughs> and I'm talking of 1940 something. Now, if you know anything about the Anglican Church, you know the lay reader. Is below the catechist. The catechist is below the reverend. The reverend is below the canon. The canon is below the archdeacon. The archdeacon is below the provost. The provost is below the bishop. And the bishop is below the archbishop. And even the archbishop in one nation is below the archbishop of Canterbury. As the biggest from, biggest one. My father was a lay reader. But today, by the special grace of God, his son and the Archbishop of Canterbury are working together hand in hand for evangelism in Britain. 
by the special grace of God. I don't want to announce it in public, but there's an agreement between the Archbishop of Canterbury and the son of that lay reader on what they can do to bring Britain back to Jesus Christ. I hereby decree that where you never can reach, your children will take your name there. Oh, thank you, Father. I want to take just one more example and then we'll <laughs> round up. But the Lord says that there's someone here today, and this is real good news. He said, regardless of household enemies, I will take you to where I plan to take you. Now, I, I want to talk about Elisha. That's, uh, I mean, you know, that's my friend. There's no way I can forget that one. You know his father. Uh, and when I say father, I'm talking about his spiritual father, Elijah. Elijah was <laughs> a mighty conqueror. I want to say amen to this one. Because daddy said there's someone here today, he said, tonight marks a major turning point in the history of your family. <laughs> and daddy is talking to someone, and he says, there is a Joseph already in your family. You will recognize him soon. Now, Elijah, you know Elijah. He was a mighty man of God. Far, far stronger than his enemy. He could shut the heavens. First Kings chapter 17, verse 1. First Kings 17, verse 1. He told Ahab, You useless king, I close the heavens until I ask for it, no rain. And immediately, the heaven was shut. He was a food multiplier. <laughs> First Kings chapter 17, verse 8 to 16. First Kings 17, 8 to 16. He multiplied the food of the widow just by saying so. He was a death chaser. First Kings 17, verse 17 to 24. First Kings 17, 17 to 24. He chased death out of the house of the widow. He was a fire commander. I'm talking of Elijah. First Kings chapter 18. Verse 30 to 39. First King 18, verse 30 to 39. He prayed. And fire fell from heaven. And it was an enemy roaster. I, I, I like that one. First, second King chapter 1, verse 9 to 12. Second Kings 1, 9 to 12. Some enemies came to arrest him and he roasted them. But what about Elisha? Uh, <laughs> he was a young man with the double anointing, which will explain why we are doing anointing service tonight. He was a man who can just say a word and causes are destroyed. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Second Kings 2, 19 to 22. It was a destroyer of poverty. 
Elisha was. That's the kind of children you should have in the home. You know, there are some children, the moment they come into a home, blessing will just begin to pour in. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. A widow was destitute, came to Elisha, and Elisha said, don't worry, your debt will be paid, and you won't even have to borrow again. He was a commander of commanders. Commander of commanders. Naaman came to him. And he didn't even bother to go and see him. He said, tell him to go and jump in River Jordan seven times. And he'll be healed. And the commander had to obey. And he was a, an arrester of the arresters. Second King chapter 6. Verse 8 to 23. 2 Kings 6, 8 to 23. They sent a whole army to arrest him. He arrested them all. And kings call him daddy. 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14. 2 Kings 13, verse 14. Even after he died, there was still enough power left in his dead bones to raise the dead. Second Kings 13, verse 20 to 21. Ah, this is a serious one. The Lord says there's someone here. He said the one who is teaching your child to steal will be exposed this month. I want to say thank you, Father, for this one. Because it's for me. I mean, I, you will understand. <laughs> Daddy said to me just now, I said, son, all those who are genuinely treating you as a daddy will be specially blessed. Yeah. I think you should thank God for me. And thank God for me. I, I, <laughs> I think you should thank God for me. So we, 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 we were talking about Elisha. His father was a terror to kings. He was a daddy to kings. I've said it before. It's a powerful thing, a great thing to be able to roast your enemies. And some of these enemies deserve roasting. We pray the prayer here. I know nobody will want to admit that, it, that prayers work. But we pray the prayer here, if you remember, that those who are keeping our guests in captivity won't be able to rest. That the fire of God will begin to burn them. Well, they are going to say they negotiated. And that's why the victory came. But I know my God is at work. And I'm going to say again, all those who are still holding my girls in captivity, the fire of God will continue to burn them until they release them all. But it is far, far better if instead of roasting them, they can come and surrender. How beautiful will it be if the head of Boko Haram should become a Christian? How beautiful will it be if in a couple of months from now he stands there at the altar and he says, this is me. I used to be a terrorist. Now, I want to be a pastor. 
If you hear that testimony, will you rejoice? <laughs> Elisha had that kind of anointing. And that is why tonight we've asked all our children to come for anointing. Because anointing makes the difference. It was anointing that gave Samson the power to tear a lion into two. Judges chapter 14, verse 5 to 6. Judges 14, 5 to 6. When we read that story, sitting down in the church, we don't get the full impact. But I've told you before, the first time I saw a lion, it was at a zoo. I think it was in Kano. It was a huge one. Alone in the cage. The cage was long. And the bars were strong. And we all moved close to the cage. When that thing is walking away, we came to the, near the cage. But when he got to the end of the cage and turned, every one of us, anointing or no anointing, we move back. That's what a lion is like. But when the anointing came on Samson, he grabbed that thing and tore it into two. The anointing to destroy lions shall come upon you tonight. And shall come upon your children tonight. In Judges 15, verse 11 to 15, Judges 15, verse 11 to 15, household enemies bound Samson. And they handed him over to external enemies. And there are some of us, we have enemies all over. Enemies from our father's side. Enemies from our mother's side. Enemies in husband's house. Enemies in wife's house. Enemies in the place of war. Some of us wonder, why am I the only one here? The enemies within handed Samson over to the enemies without. But when the anointing came, not only were the enemies without destroyed, the enemies within were disappointed. I'm praying for you tonight. All enemies within and without. Whatever their plans concerning you, they shall be disappointed. And so now I'm going to ask you to pray just for about five to ten minutes. And I want you to pray that prayer very well as we get ready for the anointing service. I want you to stand on your feet. Or if you want to kneel, you are free to do so. And just cry unto the Almighty God. And say, Father, anoint me for victory. Anoint my children for victory. Please go ahead and cry to the Almighty God. Just talk to him. Father, please anoint me for victory. Anoint my children for victory anoint my family for victory complete and absolute victory go ahead talk to the almighty god
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen.